And with that, Mark Kurlansky is or has been known for many interests and identities. He's been a commercial fisherman and a dock worker, a paralegal, a cook, a pastry chef. It's likely that most of you know him as a historian and a best-selling author. With a biography like the above, he's created a bibliography to match with books including 1997's Cod, Salt from 2002, 1968 from 2004, Nonviolence, The History of a Dangerous Idea from 2006, 2017's Paper, Paging Through History, and 2018's Milk, A 10,000-Year Food Fracas, uh, along with at least 20 others. His books have been translated into 25 languages, and he often, often illustrates them himself. With books on such a terrific variety of subjects, it's not um, a, a surprise to know he's also spent uh, years as a Caribbean correspondent for the Chicago Tribune. And as a journalist, his articles have been featured in many major news outlets. He's also been a guest, guest lecturer at universities, including Columbia School of Journalism, Yale, and others. Kurlansky's latest subject is particularly dear to many here in the Northwest. The unreasonable virtue of fly fishing is the subject of tonight's talk and of his virtual return to town hall for what I think is his fifth visit. Please join me in welcoming back Mark Kurlansky. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I want to say nice to see you, but of course I don't see you. Um, I, uh, I'm going to begin with one of my favorite rivers, which is the Big Wood in Idaho. I have lots of favorite rivers all over the world. Uh, every time I fish in one, it becomes a favorite. Um, I have drawings in the book that I've done of a dozen of my favorite rivers and also about a dozen of my favorite flies. I have to congratulate Bloomsbury in putting this book together. I think it's a really handsome little book. Um, I'm gonna start with Tolstoy, Anna Karenina. The quote is, he was fond of angling and seemed proud of being able to like such a stupid occupation. Well, stepping into the Big Wood River on a winter day, I feel the current wrap around my legs like the embrace of an old friend. That an icy river can have a warm embrace is one of nature's ironies. Ernest Hemingway fished the Big Wood River and even chose its bank as the place to die. He understood. Tolstoy, who understood so much about human nature, just didn't understand, or at least he created a character who didn't. In Anna Karenina, he wrote of two brothers who were wealthy landowners. To the first brother, there was nothing better than working in the field. He could not understand why the other brother wanted to go off and fish for perch. At the end of the day, he would meet up with the second brother and be mystified at how happy that brother was after fishing all day, even though he hadn't caught a single fish. There is not an uncommon divide, the one who fishes versus the one who doesn't. The one who does can never explain the urge to the one who doesn't. Every winter in central Idaho, while the smart set is gliding down the mountains of Sun Valley, experiencing their own version of acceleration, I make my way down snowy banks into the freezing Big Wood River in the hopes that a large and handsome rainbow trout will pull on my fly. There are days when I catch a dozen fish and days when I catch none, but I always return to town filled with a sense of peace that comes after having a great day. If I catch no fish, if my fingers are so cold that they have turned bright red and no longer work, no matter. Any day spent fishing on a wintry river is a great day. How is it possible that someone who could write Anna Karenina couldn't see that? There's two really difficult questions that I get asked all the time. Um, and I'd like to say that they're related, but I don't think they are. Um, the two questions are, why do I write and why do I fish? All they have in common is that they're both activities that I have been impulsively drawn to for as long as I can remember, um, since I was a child. Yeah, strangely, I started writing when I was a child and I started fishing. Well, 
some writers famously don't like fishing, like Tolstoy and Steinbeck. Many other writers have judged fishing harshly. Being a good writer will not necessarily make you a good angler. And there's certainly no guarantee that being skillful at fishing will make you a good writer. The only thing the two have in common is a love of solitude and a tendency for reflection. They often, but not always, attract the same type of people. Fishing, and especially fly fishing, is about asking questions. Should you take the fish? Should you fish on a sunny or an overcast day, in the river or from the river bank, with colorful flies or not? What do these fish like to eat? And at what time of day? These types of questions are endless, but underlying them all is a more fundamental question, the question of all questions. Why do it? Was 19th century President Grover Cleveland right when he stated that the urge to fish was driven by an occult and mysterious instinct? Well, in my case, I think he was right. Whenever I see a body of water, I look for fish. I started this growing up in New England, looking at the ocean. When I'm by the sea, I follow bird flight patterns because birds follow fish. When I'm by a river, I stare into glassy still pools by sides of swift moving currents, examining the ripple and livening the surface. I always ask where the fish are. And when I think I know, I wanna to try to catch them. It's an almost involuntary response, like a cat sensing the presence of a mouse. This primordial, primordial urge started when I was such a young boy that I suspect I was born with it. It was certainly not cultural. None of my adult relatives fished or even thought about fishing or understood what's up with Mark. They were all urban and not outdoors people. My grandfather, I remember, used to wear a suit and tie and hat when we took him to the beach. The only intersection of fishing and literature in my boyhood was that a good spot for reading and a good spot for fishing were the two things I asked of a natural setting. My primary reason for fishing was always clear. It was to go someplace beautiful where I could feel immersed in nature. Well, I grew up in an industrial suburb of Hartford, Connecticut, not a beautiful spot. At the end of the block where I lived, uh, there were city buses that took me to downtown Hartford in a matter of minutes, but there wasn't any bus that I knew of that took me to nature. Uh, a couple of years ago, the real estate section of the New York Times read an article about my hometown saying how it was one place where real estate prices hadn't gone up. And the article cautioned that the town's houses were especially, were not especially desirable and that there were no pleasant green spaces. But that's not how I remember it. I remember a park with a pond that had the predictable name of Mill Pond. Um, and there was a waterfall in this park and I used to sit on rocks and read. And one day while reading, I saw this flash of color underneath my feet. And I went, you know, this town didn't have any tackle shops. They had a five and dime store. And uh, there I bought some hooks and some floaters and some weights and I got some string and I found a reasonably straight branch and I tied the string to it and I rigged it up. Um, I didn't really know this, I had no idea of it, but actually it's, it's how people fished for thousands of years. There were no reels, just a line at the end of a branch. And, you know, I feel a yank on the line and I'd flip the rod and the, and the, and the, the fish would land on the shore, a little yellow sunfish. Um, then I caught another and another. And then I thought, well, there must be something on the bottom. And so I weighted it down with the sunfish on it and dragged it on the bottom. And then I would get a yank and I would catch crayfish. And, you know, see, people in Connecticut don't eat crayfish. Uh, they don't even know that they live in their waters. 
And I would bring home all these fish and crayfish to my mother and she would refuse to cook them. Um, so I stopped bringing them home, but I kept fishing. Fishing for me has always been about being involved in nature. For some hunters, the best hunters, it's the same thing. If you fish in order to participate in nature, then what exactly is your role? You're a predator. And since your prey is also a predator, you are a predator's predator. You must think like your prey in order to succeed. The bait, the plug, and the fly are all designed to appeal to the predatory instinct of a fish. You are the predator tricking this killer. So while fishers have written volumes about anglers' virtues and high character, much of which might even be true, there's also a certain ruthlessness involved. Novelist and dedicated fisherman Thomas McGuane wrote, the fisherman now is one who defies society, who rips lips, who drains the pool, who takes no prisoners. One day I was fishing the smooth, wide Snake River in Wyoming. Around me rose the majestic and muscular peaks of the Grand Tetons. I was studying the currents, catching cutthroat trout. I caught one every third or fourth cast, took it off the hook, gently eased it back into the current and cast again. I might have been doing this for an hour or three hours. You know, I always wear a waterproof watch when I fish, and then I never look at it. Time doesn't exist when you're fishing the river. But fatigue does, and I needed a break, and I waded to the bank and sat down next to my companion, who was also taking a break. As I sat down, he smiled at me and said, winning feels good, doesn't it? Though I would never have put it that way, I had to admit that this was what I was feeling. If you do it right, outsmarting a trout or a salmon with a little clump of feathers on a hook is no small accomplishment. The fish wins most of the time. On this day, only 65% of the time, but on other days, often 90% or even 100%. So fishing is a little bit about winning and losing. For centuries, fishermen have ascribed incredible virtues to fellow casters. Gervais Markham, a 16th century to 17th century English mercenary soldier who wrote poetry and wrote on food and cooking and horse breeding, was an enthusiastic fly fisherman. This is what he wrote about fly fishers. Any angler must be a scholar and a grammarian. To this description, I was adding, he must have good hand-eye coordination. Others have seen different traits in fly fishers. Sir Humphrey Davy, the brilliant father of modern chemistry, weighed in on this. Davy's great retreat from the intense intellectual and political life was to free himself by fishing for salmon. He even wrote a book, Salmonia, or Days of Fly Fishing. The book is packed with observation from his years of fishing. The science is not always as accurate as you would have expected, but much less was known about salmon then. He insisted on the high caliber of people who choose to fly fish. He said he applies sagacity to conquer difficulties and the pleasure derived from ingenious resources and devices, as well as from active pursuit, belongs to this amusement. In other words, according to one of the great scientific minds of the 19th century, to be a good fly fisherman, you need to be very smart. That's not all. They believed that fishing also required a strong scientific background, an understanding of fish and the animals they eat, knowledge of weather patterns, the life of the river, and the character. Quote, it is a pursuit of moral discipline, he wrote, requiring patience, forbearance, command of temper. Writer and environmental activist Robert H. Boyle, founder of a number of organizations to preserve the Hudson River, once said, I owe whatever I have done for this world to the fact that I am a fisherman who out of necessity became deeply involved in the workings and protection of nature. Some even assert, I would be one of them, that if you want your children to grow up to be environmentalists, you must take them fishing. 
Fisher folk can't help but praising other fishers. Joan Wolf, famously married to Lee Wolf, claimed, this is also a sport that strengthens relationships. If you can fish with someone who can probably, you can probably live with them happily. Fishing is a test of your values. Most fly fishermen are thoughtful, sensitive, caring individuals. Uh, most, but certainly not all. Francisco Franco, who ruled over Spain for 36 years with relentless brutality, was an avid fly fisherman. In fact, one of the few positive things he ever did for Spain was protecting the salmon runs in northern Spanish rivers where he liked to fish. Many believe in the healing powers of fishing. An organization called Project Healing Waters Fly Fishing tries to help veterans with emotional, psychological, and physical problems by taking them fishing. Similarly, Casting for Recovery aims to help women with breast cancer by organizing retreats built around cancer education. Fly fishing is for the curious. Every river is different. Every beat on each river is different. Every river has its own fish. The shape and the bottom and every river sings its own song. I think I was born loving the sea and fishing it, but fly fishing has taught me to love rivers. Every time you fish, you learn something new. There's no end to it. The fisher who thinks he or she knows everything knows nothing. Fly fishing is done for sport. It would be dumb. It would be a dumb way to catch fish if you were hungry. And it's for that reason that many Native Americans are contemptuous of fly fishing. Yet a few have become proficient at it in places like Alaska where being a fly fishing guide is the best job available. But most think that the purpose of fishing for is for food. It is a gift from the gods, and to play with it for recreation is disrespectful. If a sport, fly fishing is an ancient sport. Romans did it. And their description, even their flies, sound familiar. In early times, you needed enough skills. You need a lot of skills today, but in early times, you needed to be a good enough blacksmith to forge the right kind of hook with the right length of shank and the right depth of curve. Uh, you had to find your own wood to build your own rod, and you had to make your own lines. For a long time, lines were made from the hair of horse tails. And for a tapered line, you would... Uh, On the thick end, you might have eight hairs, and then you go down to six hairs and four hairs. And if you were a really good fisherman, at the end, the leader would be one single hair. Um, to catch a trout, they even caught salmon this way with a single hair on the tip. That takes a bit of skill. For thousands of years, fishing was, was done, it was called a gorge, which was a piece of bone or shell or, or horn pointed at both ends. Then when the line was pulled tight, the gorge turned sideways in the fish's throat. Gorges have been found that are 70,000 years old. But eventually it was realized that hooks would be better. The Maori made hooks with human bones. The New Guinea people made them with claws of large insects. Hooks were also made from eagle jaws. <clears throat> Barrel cactus spurs and the ancient Egyptians were the first to realize that a hook would hold even better if the fish, in the fish's mouth if it had a reverse point, a barb, which, had already, which they had already used on spears. In Chinese manuscripts written about 3,500 years ago during the Shang Dynasty, which ruled the Yellow River Valley, the use of an artificial fly for fishing was described. I've crossed the wide rushing gravel bottom of Yellow River, which in the spring is literally yellow and uh, would be suitable for fly fishing, except that it's it, the cloudiness of the water. But it seems that the ancients did fly fish in it. Um, Homer mentions fly fishing. Um, Claudius 
Alienus is generally thought to be the first Westerner to talk about fly fishing. And he described red wool fastened around a hook with uh, two feathers which grow from a coxwaddle. Um, he describes fly fishing exactly the way we know it today. Um, now, I have to tell you a little about my thoughts about grizzly bears. Um, don't like them. Uh, you know, in Alaska, they try to convince you, guys try to convince you, it's a great tri trick to be out there fishing with the grizzly bears. And a guy once offered to take me to a place where the bear, uh, after you got the after you got the fish on the hook and were, when you were bringing it in, the bear would chase after it. Struck me as a really bad idea. Um, bears kind of sit around and watch you fish, and I can't help thinking that what they're thinking is, what the hell is this guy doing? I mean, there's this animal that catches fish, kind of sticking his mouth in the in the river and grabbing it with his teeth what does he think i'm doing he just stares thinks it's very strange in the kamchatka peninsula in russia in the pacific there's a huge amount of grizzly bears and they train these dogs which they call lycus which are a type of sled dog these white dogs with curly tails um, that chase away the bears they just make a lot of ugly noises, and the bears don't like it, and they and they uh, they run away. But you know, dogs always know people who love dogs. So these dogs, I was in this camp, and they had three lycus, and they all hung out with me because I rubbed their bellies and their heads, and lying there rubbing them. And a bear walks into the camp, and I say to the dogs, "Come on, guys, there's a bear." And they're going like, oh, could you scratch a little to the left, please? And the bear was practically up to me when <laughs> the dogs finally got up and chased them away. One of them actually bit a bear in the butt. Um, they're great dogs. Um, I'm keeping an eye on time here. Um, I wanted to talk a little about uh, about tying flies. You know, tying flies is a it's, it's the kind of disease that appeals to writers because writers are always looking for an excuse to get up and do something else. So I go over to the other table and tie a few flies. Um, I got obsessed with tying a thing called a McGinty, which looks like a bee, and it's not made anymore. And then the the, the reason I know about McGinty's is because it's in Hemingway. Um, so I got a pattern for it, and I decided to tie some McGinty's, and they called for this kind of a wings from a white hawk feather with a brown tip. And I checked everywhere where I get these things. Nobody had a feather like this. And then one day, I live in Manhattan, and I'm walking down 86th Street, and these two white pigeon feathers start drifting by me. So I grabbed them and I cut them down to the right shape and I painted the tips with a brown magic marker and it worked perfectly. You can't admit that you tie your flies, flies with magic markers, but it does work with the ink. The magic markers is waterproof. Um, I just wanted to, before I'm completely out of time, I wanted to talk a little about women. Um, you know, there's two legends about women in fishing, and they're both sexist. One is that women bring you bad luck, and the other is that they bring you fish. Um, and um, so, you know, there's those people who want to have some women fishing with them to draw the fish, and there's one that people think, oh, you should, if you look see a woman there's an irish myth that if you see a woman on your way to the fishing spot it's not going to be a good day um but women have actually fished fly fished for uh quite a long time even in the days when women wore skirts floor-length skirts and 
were all trussed up and rods were two-handed as they still are but they used to, you know the reason why they were two-handed rods is they used to be so heavy you couldn't cast them any other way and heavy brass reels and um they did it um and um i know several cases of women who uh have earned reputations as great fly fishers which is the guide I work with in Ireland, Glenda Powell, who's considered the best caster and best guide in, in Ireland, she got this reputation by doing casting competitions. Um, so did Joan Wolf. Um, Joan Wolf was a dancer, and she insisted that it was dancing that enabled her to be a good caster. And I happen to know this is true because my daughter Talia. Um, has been a ballet dancer since she was very young. And when I took her fishing, I was absolutely amazed by her sense of rhythm and timing. Um, uh, dancers do make the best fly fishing casters. Um, I just want to tell you my favorite women fishing story, and then I'll, I'll open up for questions. Now, this is a story that I've stolen from... Uh, Tom McGuinn, who is a wonderful novelist, but also an avid fisherman. And he tells this story in his book on fly fishing, The Longest Silence, which I would recommend, um, about an Englishman he met in Norway. We told him a story about fishing with his mother, and his mother had no interest in fly fishing. And they were on the River Alta, which is one of the great rivers of Norway, Salmon River. Um, and one day, uh, he and his father convinced his mother to go fishing. And she caught a 50-pound salmon, and then she never fished again. Years later, the son sat beside her on her deathbed. And as she lay, <clears throat> as she lay dying, slipping in and out of consciousness, she opened her eyes looked at him and said, you'll never catch a 50 pound salmon. And then she closed her eyes and died. Um, today, there are 6.5 million Americans fly fishing and a third of them are women. And that percentage is growing all of the time. Um, in fact, they talk about fly fishing becoming increasingly popular, but the only demographic group that is causing that is women. There are more and more women fly fishermen. So hope to see you out there. Um, thank you. I'm going to stop there and I'd be glad to take questions. Cool. Uh, thanks so much, Mark. Um, yeah, I want to remind anybody who's watching out there to uh, submit a question, but in the meantime, um, I, I just have uh, a question. I don't really know anything about fly fishing, but I'm wondering, does it seem like it's a sport that is kind of um, on the rise as far as interest goes? Or do you feel like it's uh, one that is kind of losing, losing steam? No, it's becoming more and more popular, uh, which is why I like winter fishing so much, because in the winter you can get on a river and have it to yourself. Uh, any good fishing river in the summertime is crowded these days. Oh, okay. um, so on the one hand, I'm glad to see it become more popular. On the other hand, I would be perfectly happy to have it all to myself. <laughs> is there a specific type of river that you're that you're looking for when you when you're going out? Uh, a beautiful one. A beautiful one. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I ask is that the river be beautiful. It's like when I was fishing that spot in the Snake River and staring at the Grand Tetons, I felt like I don't need any fish. Just standing here in this water looking at these mountains is all I need. But then as an extra, I actually did catch fish. Um, what would you say is sort of the state of our rivers these days, uh, having spent a lot of time uh, with them? Are they, are they as, uh, you know, I go and I look at a river and I maybe don't, I don't see the same things as you would. Well, I mean, trout rivers are in better shape than salmon rivers. Salmon have huge problems, too many dams 
um, salmon are an androgynous fish. They go out to sea, they have to come back, you dam the rivers, you destroy the river. Um, so that's a huge problem. There's a lot of other problems with rivers, the deforestation of riverbanks. Um, a, a successful river, if it has these type of fish, insectivores, um, needs to have good natural banks full of insect life. Um, so actually, you know, people who love the river, so they build a home on it, they're killing the river. <laughs> you should, you shouldn't be roads by riverbanks. You should, you should stay away from the banks. Even hiking trails shouldn't be too close to the banks of rivers. Mm. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of trains and yeah, railways built, built next to rivers. That's probably not great. Yeah. Um, do you do any other hunting? Any other hunting, or, do you, or maybe you don't call that hunting? I suppose. I I do, I mean fishing. I've always fished. I I started fishing, <clears throat> surf casting, which is what you do in New England if you don't own a boat. You know, okay. uh, uh, surf casting for stripers and blues, and I think that's where I got into casting. Um, I could spend all day just perfecting my cast, whether I caught a fish or not. Hmm. Um, uh, I don't hunt. Okay. Uh, I don't have anything morally against hunting, but I, I, I only went hunting once. I, I, I don't like guns, which is also not political. I just really don't like them. I don't know why people like them. You know, you get belted in the shoulder and they make your ears ring when you fire <laughs> them. And I just think they're unpleasant. So I was saying this to a friend of mine in Utah who wanted to go hunting with me. And he said, fine. There was a bow hunting season, so we went bow hunting, right. and and that was incredible. And stalking is like fishing. Stalking a deer, you have to know, you have to learn everything about it before you can get close enough to shoot it with an arrow. But then I did, and I I killed this buck, and he died in front of me. His legs sort of buckled, and he looked up at me. This is a pathetic story. I, I pet him on the head and said, I'm sorry. Oh, man. I, felt, I felt so <laughs> terrible that I've never killed another mammal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but for some reason, I don't, well, I don't kill most of the fish that I catch. You know, Jimmy Carter, who's a great fly fisherman and hunter and all these things, says, if it really bothers you, then just don't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so, you're, I, that's great. You got to what I was uh, kind of getting at. I grew up with deer, a deer hunter, and uh, just wondering kind of what the sort of comparison is. There, if it's kind of the same fulfillment wise. And, I, I have this idea that that biologically, the closer to us they are, the more feeling we have about them. It's why mm -hmm. you know yeah. we care more about marine mammals than we do about fish. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was once fishing in San Francisco, and I I hooked a seal. Oh wow! I was trying to hook. I was trying to get a striped bass. I was fishing for striped bass, and I hooked a seal, yeah. and I, I I felt terrible. And then I wondered why did I feel so terrible? And yet, if I had gotten the striped bass that I wanted, I would have felt great. Right, right. I think it's the eyes. Mm -hmm. Mammals have these eyes that are designed to make you feel guilty. Yeah, <laughs> you feel like there's a there's soul, a soul there. there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've got a couple of questions coming in here. Um, so Chris is asking, have you read The Feather Thief about stealing rare birds from uh, natural history museums for tying Victorian fly patterns? And if so, what did you think about the book and the story? I think I've heard yes, that. I, 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 I did read it. it it's, a great, it it's a great story. I mean, the, I, I've seen these... 19th century salmon flies that are made with quetzals and all these exotic birds that have become endangered. And it was absolutely crazy. I mean, they were gorgeous flies, but you know, the salmon don't care about all that stuff. Um, uh, it, it was just a, it, it was just a craziness. But what I really loved about this book is that this guy, it's about this guy breaks into this museum that has historic feathers. It has feathers from Darwin expeditions and things like that. And he steals a bunch of feathers and he, he sells them off to, to, to fly tires. And he gets caught. 
And when the police interview him and he explains about the feathers and the fly tying and what feathers he used for which things and everything about it, uh, he beat the rap because they decided that he was crazy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and I, I think that, you know, there's something there. <laughs> we become so obsessed with flies. It is, it is a kind of craziness. And they, they can be very expensive. Is that right? Not, you know, they're not really terribly expensive. <laughs> That's the whole thing about tying them yourself is that, mm -hmm. you know, then you can, you can, you can go to the store you can go to the local store and you can buy, you can buy beautiful ones for very little money. Okay. And, um, and they're, they're, they're suited for the river, you know, for the local river. So what I do is I tie flies in the wintertime, like everybody else. And then I take them with me when I go fishing and then I buy a bunch of things from the locals to fish with. And I hardly ever use the fish I tie. I mean, the supplies I tie. Yeah. Um, Let's see. Can you tell us about fishing on the Kach uh, Kach Kamchatka? Um, I understand there are huge salmon there. There's huge everything there. Yeah. <laughs> there's um, there's huge grayling. I mean, grayling are not a big fish, but I, I, I caught this 24-inch grayling, which my Russian guide insisted was a record breaker, which actually I looked it up later. It wasn't, but pretty unusual. I, you know, rainbow trout the size of salmon, but also salmon. But the, the thing that's incredible about fishing there is there's like about eight different species, you know, and, and so you, you you just never know what you're going to catch next. And the fun is when you get when you get a hit, you try to guess by the way it took the fly what you have. There, you know, is is this a chinook? Is is this a sockeye? Is this a grayling? A rainbow? Um, and after a while, you get to learn the bite of the different fish. Yeah, um, it, it's you know, it's, it's a funny kind of fishing. You know, I was I was catching like twenty or more fish a day, um, which, which is one kind of fun. But you know. I, I love fishing on the Blackwater River in County Cork, Ireland. Hardly ever catch anything there, and I'm just as happy. <laughs> yeah, it's more about the experience. Right. Um, somebody's asking if you can uh, fly fish in Manhattan, which seems unlikely, but if you can possible? fly, You can fish in Manhattan, but you can't. Can't fly. can't fly fish in Manhattan because there's no uh, there's no salmonids. You know, there's there's no char or, or trout or uh, salmon. Um, the thing about fishing in Manhattan is that, as I was saying, you know, the, 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 the path of fishing is to be in a beautiful spot. I love Manhattan for a lot of things, but it's not my idea of a spot to be fishing in. Right. I, I, I heard recently that um, they're putting a beach in Manhattan, which seemed... Well, like kind of a funny idea. <laughs> well, then they used to they 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 used to have them until they realized how unhealthy the water was. Right. Um, they've they've cleaned up the water a lot because of the Clean Water Act. Um, but I'm still not sure you want to go swimming with all those PCBs. Right. Right. Uh, let's see. Have you fished in any uh, Pacific Northwest rivers? Well, I fished a bunch of, in. Um, Alaska, and I've fished the, I fished the Willamette, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, let's see. I've got a couple of questions here, kind of on the same line of thinking. Do you know of good ways uh, for someone new to get into fishing? Um, should they go out in groups or something like that? No, look, like <clears throat> this is this is all you have to do. It's it, it it's so simple. You don't even have to buy anything. You have to find a great place to go fishing and then you hire a guide and the guide will provide all the tackle you need. He knows everything about that river. He will teach you how to fish. He will teach you how to work that river and you'll have a great experience and you'll even catch fish. Are Pretty there much. any, uh, are there any uh, things not to do uh, in that, <laughs> in that first time going out that people should know? Well, I always think that the, the, the first rule of fly fishing is don't fall in. 
Uh, some rivers have very slippery rocks. And, uh, um, you don't want to, you know, there's a whole argument about whether we should be in the river anyway, because it, it spooks the fish. I mean, what do they think? I mean, I'm kind of a clumsy guy. What do they think of this big clumsy that guy there in the river? <clears throat> um, if you look at old uh, drawings of fishermen, they were fishing from the banks, even sometimes hiding behind rocks. But um, the thing is that sanding in the river, which has become much more popular since waders have gotten really good, it's a great feeling. You know, you really feel part of the river when you're standing in there. So I do it. Um. I'm wondering if there's if there are things that you can tell about an environment based on the fish that you that you find in that area. Is there like, um, you know, th th you can tell something about the forest by the by the birds you see in it. Is there something about a river and the types of fish you find in it that uh, kind of give you a clue as to what you're looking at? Well, there's all kinds of things, um, you know. If, if the fish are really smart, <laughs> if, they're, if they're kind of wise to your flies, you know you're fishing in a river that a lot of people have fished in before you. Um, if, they're, if they're just gobbling up flies like happy fools, this may be a river that's fed by a hatchery. <laughs> um, oh, interesting. Uh, but, you know, all rivers are different and, and the fish are different in, in each river and um, and of course, there's all these different species of fish. So, uh, you know, brook trout are very, brook trout are happy fools. Some people say they're, they're like the teenager of trout. <laughs> you know, they're, just, they're just crazy and they take lots of chances and they fall for any fly you put in. And, and you got to be a lot more savvy for a brown trout or a rainbow trout. I personally love rainbow trout. Yeah, for, for someone who has, I've maybe only fished like once, it's kind of interesting to think of different types of fish having different personalities or different like Yeah, but it's not, only, that. it's not only the species, but it's the river. They adapt to the river and the, mm. they, uh, the fish are different even in the same species from one river to another, noticeably different. Oh, interesting. Huh. Yeah, when I was fishing the Ozernaya in the Kamchatka, um, yeah, you could tell a number of things. You could tell that this was a, a huge river because it was like colonized in different parts of the river. And you could tell that um, they hadn't faced a lot of fishermen because um, they, they, they really they fell for just about anything. <laughs> what happened to I was, I was fishing these flies they call Dalai Lamas, which um, may be an intentional insult to Tibetan Buddhism because Tibetan Buddhism doesn't allow fishing. Um, and I had light ones and I had dark ones. So I'd fish a while with a light one. And if nobody was taking the light one, I'd change to a dark one. And either a light one or a dark one worked every time. <laughs> These are fish who, you know, they, they hadn't learned the tricks yet. Um. Let's see. Can you, uh, Chuck is wondering if you can say something about your new book, Salmon, uh, published by Patagonia? Question mark? Yeah. Um, no longer my new book, because now this is my new book, but this was the, the book before. <laughs> Still pretty new. It just came out last year. Oh, yeah. um, you know, I did this book because, um, you know, people have this idea that the great problem with commercial fish is, is, is fishermen and overfishing. Uh, in 1997, I did a book about cod at a time when the most famous uh, northern stock collapsed and people started thinking a lot about uh, overfishing. And now, you know, people look at a commercial fishery and they just assume the problem is overfishing. But actually, a fishery today whose only problem was overfishing would be wonderful. That would be such an easy problem to solve. There's so many different things going on. And I wrote a book about salmon because salmon, uh, salmon shows this. I mean, everything, because it's androgynous, because it's in the ocean and in the fresh water, uh, everything that we do wrong is killing salmon uh, from 
deforestation, to pollution, to dam building, to climate change, climate change. Climate change is the real killer. And so that basically, uh, if you could save the earth, you could save the salmon or vice versa. Um, so I thought it would be, it was a good way to talk about trying to save the earth. Um, Ross is wondering if you ever eat what you catch. I think you said you do a lot of catch and release, but do you ever eat what you catch? I do sometimes. I, I, I do sometimes if I'm, I'm often not in a situation um, uh, okay, I, I'll, I'll confess something to you. I hate camping. Absolutely hate camping. When I was a journalist in different wars and things like that, I had to go camping. And, you know, the idea of camping for fun is completely alien to me. So <laughs> when I'm through fishing, I'm, I'm going back to the lodge or something. So uh, there's no point in taking the fish. Um but every once in a while, I do. Um, uh, I think a salmon or a trout, just grilled, is, is, is a great dish. You're doing nothing more to it than just uh, splitting it and grilling it. Uh, let's see. I think, I think this might be Bob. Um, have you fished uh, Western Montana streams before? Can, and if so, can you share a tail or two? Also, do you use float tubes or rafts at all? Um, you know, I can't be everywhere. I have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I haven't fished Montana. I fished Wyoming and I fished Idaho, but I've never fished Montana. I should correct that sometime. I, I have used rafts on the Salmon River in Idaho, which is a gorgeous river, uh, Steelhead River. And have you used float tubes or, or rafts? Uh, a raft. Mm -hmm. um, well, we are at the end of our questions. I wonder if you wanted to just say any closing, anything in closing uh, before we sign off here. No, I, I, um, I really can't think of many things that are more pleasurable than fly fishing. And so I was hoping that I wrote a pleasurable book and I hope you enjoy it. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, My pleasure. And yeah, this has been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot, I feel like. So thank you so much. Um, I want to thank the audience too. Thanks for your questions. I want to encourage you, if you're interested in buying a copy of the book, to click on the link in the chat. That's going to take you to Third Place Books so we can support a local store. Um, yes, and I, please, everybody, support local stores. Mm -hmm. Really really hard pressed these days and we really need to support them yeah definitely um hopefully uh the next time around uh for some of your upcoming uh works we can have you back at the venue i, I love you, it i hope that works out thanks so much thank you